Allen. I am a research computing manager at the Advanced Research Computing Technology Services Group at the University of Michigan. Um, I've been in research, in academic research, for 23 years, and I've been supporting HPC and advanced research computing for about the last 15. I built my first HPC cluster 15 years ago. It was 256 cores and running DDR InfiniBand, and uh, every system I've built since then has been progressively larger and progressively bigger. Um, at this point, I now manage three teams. I manage the data science team, which I'll talk about today. I manage storage, and I also manage um, a private cloud and enclaves team inside the university. Um, so, University of Michigan, who are we? Um, collectively, we like to think of ourselves as the Ivy of the Midwest, though I think several other universities might want to contest that. Um, we have roughly 20,000 staff members, roughly about 50,000 or so students. Um, we have roughly, about five years ago, we ran about $1.1 billion in research expenditures. And today, this last year, we ran about $1.5 billion. The University of Michigan has been investing heavily in academic research um, in a broad portfolio of uh, research expenditures, both in the health system and in the university proper. Um, we're one of the few public universities with both a full health system and a university. And uh, the other joke we have is that we're 19 schools and colleges united by a single football team. Um, there's a diverse amount of research, a diverse, diverse amount of interests. Um, the group I work for, Advanced Research Computing and Technology Services, or RTS, um, we provide comprehensive computational storage tools for university researchers. So we provide everything from high-performance computing. Um, we also provide high-throughput computing on the same machine, which is you know, HTC, for those of you who don't know. Um, we provide storage. We provide big data um, in private enclaves. And uh, we tie it all together with high-speed networking. Um, we recently just took from Dell 14,000 cores of Intel HPC, roughly about three months ago. Um, we run four HPC clusters, the cluster I just mentioned. Uh, we, run a, we run a restricted data cluster for people in the medical services and in people working with um, restricted data from the government. Um, we also run a condo cluster, or a cluster for researchers who, whose grant prevent them from using a shared cluster, and therefore they need to buy their own um, hardware for some reason or another. Um, and then we recently, about four and a half years ago, we acquired an IBM Power 8 machine. And so we have a diverse amount of hardware across Intel. Um, we've, we've run AMD clusters. We even ran a Power PC cluster back in the day. Um, so we have a lot of experience with a lot of different things. Um, we run roughly about 25 petabytes or so of aggregate storage. Our um, clusters run about five petabytes of scratch. Um, we run about five petabytes of high-speed storage. We have about five petabytes or so in what we would call a cheap and deep storage service where we're balancing costs to the researcher versus performance to get, in, to get and put the data in the service. And then we provide a data archive roughly of 10 petabytes that's all on tape. We provide an end-to-end -end storage service for our researchers from data acquisition all the way to I need to keep the data for seven years so that people want to reproduce my results, they can come and get them again. Um, our goal at the, at the University of Michigan is to make data easy to analyze, easy to move, move data close to the compute, um, but also be able to scale for the researcher who wants to do something very simple on one or two cores, all the way up to building a complex parallel job of 1,000 cores. And if you want to move bigger, then we, you know, we're collaborating with Exceed and national resources to go to people who want to do 10,000 cores or 15,000 cores. Whatever we build at the University of Michigan has to scale itself. So everything we build, from our storage services to our compute to our enclaves, we have to be able to add to it very quickly and very easily. And so we're going to add, when we add something new, we're just adding new nodes for HVC clusters. We're adding new storage nodes for our storage services. Um, we're adding drives. We're adding tapes. Right? Everything we do has to scale very quickly and easily. Um, Research, as, we, you know, as I like to say, is a lowest cost business. If, a, if the government looks at a research project that's going to cost $40,000 or $50,000 to do the same thing, they'll pick the $40,000 version every time. And so from our perspective, from a researcher's perspective, they want services that have to provide a balance of costs and of performance. And that's what we look to do every time. So why do we look at ARM for data science? Um, what, you know, what does ARM bring to us? So when we looked at this three years ago and started this project, we were looking at the Cavium Thunder X platform. And it provided a number of interesting features that we were, we were curious about. Um, each, ARM pro each ARM machine, or each Thunder X machine, had 48 cores in a processor, 96 cores in a dual processor machine. Um, there was rapid data flow between the CPU and the networking, um, allowing for basically no bottlenecks. Um, each node had 40 gigabit native on board. So when you're moving data into the system or out of the system, it moved quickly and efficiently. Um, and finally, the Thunder X motherboard chassis provided enough high capacity drives per node to provide a sizable HDFS for people who are doing big data problems. 
For the university proper, we believe that diversity in our architectures drives innovation and research. We providing, by providing a new architecture to a researcher, they can, may come up with a novel methodology that they couldn't do on another architecture. Um, and ourselves inside the office, we also like to understand new methodologies and research to stay competitive with other universities. So for us, um, in 2016, there was mutual interest between Marfell, or Cavium at the time, to explore Thunder Science for data, or data, Thunder X for data science in an applied setting. So we acquired 40 plus or so, 40 or so nodes from Gigabyte. Um, it collectively provided us roughly about 4,000 cores, roughly about 25 terabytes of RAM, and aggregately three petabytes of HDFS, with really one singular goal. We wanted to build an analytics environment using common Hadoop tools for research use. At the time, we had a modest uh, cluster that was close to HPC cluster that was running uh, Spark, the Spark um, uh, Hive, PySpark and PySpark R, and then we were looking at the time Parquet to try to improve performance for researchers. And so we started with that very basic set of tools and moved forward. And because we had x86-64 experience, it seemed very straightforward. In fact, I think you know, one of the first things we said early on was, well, it's Java, it's all Java, it should be really easy to move, right? Um, yeah, well. <laughs> um, we did build, manage to build a working cluster. We had a shorter engagement with Hortonworks that was actually fruitful and built as a cluster. It was not supportable, it was not reproducible in any way, but we were able to make things go. And it was very encouraging to us that we could sit down and build a cluster very quickly. Um, but we had to rebuild nearly everything along the way at the time. Um, you know, we discovered that you know, the, the Hadoop architecture is just a complex stack of, software, stack of software dependent on each other to work properly. I mean, those independencies make it very difficult uh, to make changes, to you know, make small modifications. Um, and it took us some time, but we finally got somewhere after the Hortonworks experience to actually build something that worked. Um, but we ran into two pretty, you know, minor pain points, but still something that was significant for us. For example, libhadoop, the, the library that comes, it's a core library that comes with Hadoop, um, has bytecode dependencies on x86 that actually help with compression and provide performance benefits. Um, these libraries don't really work on ARM or don't are really feasible. And so there was already a small performance, benefit, performance issue that we had to contend with immediately. Um, it, was, it was kind of painful, but it was something that could be worked around. Um, there is this issue with a piece of software called Protobuf that Hadoop depends on. And when we started, we were working with CentOS, and the version of Protobuf that came with CentOS at the time was a more advanced version than what Hadoop was experiencing or was expecting. Um, and we had some problems basically getting it working. We had to work back porting Protobuf to get to a point where we can make it work with Hadoop. Um, we still have to patch this to this day. It's actually one of those things that's kind of surprising that it still exists. Um, I would like to say that when we built the first twin cluster, we actually found some RPMs that were um, ARM available that were working, you know, that had basically been using uh, Fedora, I think, Fedora 21 or 20 or something like that, that really got us over the hump to in some of the final pieces to make this thing work. Um, and so we didn't know where these RPMs really came from. And it turns out that we, we'd never really heard about Lenaro, but um, we, we, we found a reference to them on CentOS list. And it turns out that the RPMs we built, initially, initially built with actually came from Lenaro. Um, and so we talked to uh, Ganesh's team over in Lenaro Group, and they've been extremely helpful to us in actually making progress at a rapid rate. Um, we repackaged a lot of the RPMs that we had gotten um, to solve many of the problems we had. So, um, you know, We've had, over further engagements with Lenaro, we've been working very closely with them to get farther down the road. And when they went to Big Top, um, we managed, we've been working very closely with them to go to Big Top and move forward. And so initially, one of the other things we did that was an, a really interesting problem was we work very closely with our HPC team. Um, our HPC team works, builds a cluster using Ansible. Uh, we don't use a lot of the, the common HPC tools like Werewolf or anything like that. It's pretty much a custom in-house pro, in project. Um, we use their Ansible toolkit to build our first data science cluster. One of the problems that, one of the ways they solve their problems whenever they do a common upgrade is they'll wipe, burn down the computer and then they'll just reinstall it using Ansible from the ground up. They'll disconnect you know, Lustre so that Lustre, you don't have to worry about losing user data or anything like that. Um, we did that the first couple times when we built this cluster, um, but we discovered very quickly that it was fraught with peril because you can't easily disconnect HDFS. Right? There's always a chance that with HDFS you might burn, you know, might, you might accidentally format over the drives on individual servers. Um, we managed, to, we finally worked with the HPC team to build a system that wasn't burn it all down and start over again. And now we at least use Yum Update to bring up machines. Um, but today, you know, we manage the cluster with Ansible, and we do, you know, twice a yearly updates, basically gradual Yum updates, um, and it's a very smooth operating cluster. 
We started um, this project roughly in 2016. We were able to hand it to users in, the, um, in June of 2018, um, and we, we were in pilot mode through 2018 up until the summer. And we handed out, we were in full production starting in May. Um, and this semester, the semester that started in September is the full, first full semester where we have full user base and full coursework running on the cluster. Um, and so we have roughly about a dozen research groups and about a half dozen courses who are using the cluster for both teaching and learning and data analysis. Um, we, we, initially, we initially put on a, what we call the Canvas Reddit repository, repository which is a uh, full copy of all the Reddit data. Um, going back to you know, the initial run of uh, the first initial deployment of Reddit. Um, and we use that primarily for teaching and learning and for internal testing. Um, recently, we onboarded the local campus Twitter repository, which roughly holds, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the initial use cases that we really we want to identify were based around social sciences. Social sciences are heavily underserved at the university. Um, social scientists um, don't really know anything about HPC, and they don't really do parallel computing very well. Um, and so data science, you know, they're almost all of their workers with data, with, with contextual and post-analysis. Anal post and so for us, it was very straightforward to introduce them to the Hoop cluster. Um, and quite a few groups have taken it, you know, like a duck to water. Um, they use it mostly, again, for contextual analysis. And one of the more interesting projects when we first deployed the cluster was fake news detection. Um, basically using, uh, uh, you know, looking for emotional language in uh, social media posts and using that to try to detect whether or not this was, you know, providing slanted news sources or whether or not it was a straight news reporting. Um, we actually had a really great uh, kiosk at Supercomputing last year, if anybody was at Supercomputing, where we basically put you up against our, our fake news detector that we were running on Hadoop cluster, where you could basically try to f figure out if five questions were fake news or not. Um, and by and large, it was about 50-50. It was kind of surprising. Um, so our campus Twitter repository um, roughly is about, um, it's actually about a, almost a petabyte of Twitter deca, deca host data now, which is 10% of all the data in Twitter. Um, the data repository currently exists in, in a uh, uncompressed form. Um, we're currently in the process of recompressing it all into Parquet format. So it currently sits in the full petabyte on the Hadoop cluster. Interestingly enough, the whole thing actually compresses extraordinarily well, and we expect that once it gets compressed down, it'll roughly consume about 150 or 200 gigabytes when it's all said and done. Um, we also have some researchers who've been contributing data over time. They drink from the Twitter firehose regularly, and so they pretty much will add the firehose data that they, um, to supplement the other data. So we've been bringing in roughly about 20 gigabytes of tweets per day into the system. And this is provided to all researchers across campus. Um, they just have to provide uh, the Institute for Data Science um, a justification of why they want to have access, and they'll generally get it. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about is uh, you know, some of the projects that have been using the cluster to date. Um, the first project that I'd like to talk about is uh, a work by Dr. Romero and his uh, student in the School of Information. And they've been using the Twitter repository and other social media to understand the effects of disasters on communities. Um, they gather data from frequent public users and their local networks um, before and after an event. Um, and they're really looking at usage. Um, they're looking at, you know, and they basically also want to do a longitudinal study, so they're looking at multiple events. And the goal is to understand how, you know, who do people contact in the aftermath of one of these events? Um, does, the, uh, does the circle they talk with shrink or grow? Um, do they reach out to more public sources? And of those public sources, are the official sources, the government sources? Are they news media? Does the news media that they contact change from media that they've contacted beforehand? Or does it grow to um, reach a wider circle? Um, some of this work is both just drinking for the fire hose, and some of this work, I, I, my, my understanding is they actually will reach out to individual people in various places and, and try to, um, they'll either see them in places or they'll get some feedback afterwards. Um, the second project that I find very interesting that's been working with our cluster is um, a project in political science. And the goal is to measure policy diffusion, that is, how do, how do um, bills and laws diffuse throughout the government system in the United States? And they've been working with data for 20 years, from 95 to 14. Um, and they, ba they basically, um, I don't know the size of the data they, they're consuming, but it's a massive amount of data and a massive amount of laws. Um, and they're basically allowed, they basically can build these textual comparisons um, and, build, and build analysis to understand how these things um, diffuse. Um, and they've discovered that new policies are diffused through, the, through using Spark on our cluster that they weren't able to do with any other project and that the earlier a project, or earlier, earlier bills and laws are passed and start working through the system, the faster they go over time. 
Um, and it's been extraordinarily successful for them. Um, it's, offered, it's, it's opened up further lines of research into patterns. I believe they're applying it to other countries, other places, and also looking into other fields to apply the methodology. I'd like to talk a little bit at this point about lessons we've learned in this project. Um, if this is, you know, some of the things I'd talk about you know, have been great for us. You know, Big Top has been straightforward and outstanding for us. It accelerated our rate to deployment. Um, the new CentOS and you know, Red Hat packages that have been being deployed in the system is perfect for us because we need to provide an operationally supportable cluster, and we're a CentOS shop, um, and it's been very helpful. Um, at this point, given Big Top, we think we can build a fully reproducible cluster in roughly two to three days or so if we were to have a major disaster. Um, one of the things that we've been coming across is we've been, our researchers use Conda. How many people are familiar with the Conda distribution for Python? Okay. So Conda is a very popular open source distribution for Python. Um, it is consumable at multiple scales. We have copies installed in our HPC cluster by licensing through Conda, uh, but individual researchers can download it at no cost. And it is a fully featured distribution for Python. I mean, you get, your Py you get Python, Matplotlib, NumPy, SciPy for all your computational needs. Um, and it is, so researchers use this on a regular basis. Um, our researchers are used to this because it's on all our clusters. Um, people can get it and put it on our private, you know, on our private cloud or in our, our enclaves. Um, one of the places that it's missing, and we've had a lot of requests for, is making these things available in, in, to researchers um, on our cluster. It's probably the biggest gap that we cannot currently fill in terms of software. One of the things when we were starting in 2016 that we had problems fitting and working with um, is that early packaging with software and, and cluster, uh, on the cluster was focused mostly on Debian, Ubuntu, and Fedora. And we're primarily a CentOS shop. You know, we use CentOS because of stability and supportability. Um, and some of it is also inertia. You know, a lot of researchers expect to see, or expect at the time to see CentOS, and so um, it's what we primarily provide to our researchers. Um, we spent a lot of effort and time early on translating our Fedora packaging to CentOS. Um, this is not as much of a problem as it used to be, um, but you know, the ability to the, for, the, you know, for the community to provide CentOS packaging, at least from, to make it easily supportable and deployable for us, is extremely helpful. One of the things that we've been hearing about, this is something that I'm not sure is currently a problem, but it is something that I want to bring to people's attention. Um, and this is something that also is sort of the tip of the iceberg for us, so I'm going to talk about it more later. Um, but Apache Spark is, a, um, is, a, is, is actually the software that we use on this ecosystem. Um, and there's been talk about, you know, in this PySpark community about not developing against ARM64 for future versions. Um, if, a, if a developer all of a sudden decides not to deploy for ARM64, how do we convince them that it's in their best interest to keep, keep going and keep moving forward? So as an organization, what are our future goals in moving forward? Um, our short-term goals are actually pretty straightforward. You know, we're looking at Hadoop 3.0. Um, there was a great talk that was given about Ambari earlier today that we're, we're interested in, because I think we could use Ambari for metrics. Um, but as a larger, long-term set of goals, social science data is really, um, it's the tip of the iceberg on data, in terms of data for us on campus. The bulk of data that we see on campus is restricted in some fashion or another. Um, primarily, um, we look at health system data. So there are two sources of data that are restricted. There's health system data, and that is being made available to researchers for the full, first time um, at the university, which is basically the, research, the, the health system data warehouse. It's a modified form of all the patient visits, all the patient data that currently sits in our health system. And you know, over time, researchers can start making requests for subsets of that data, and we'll be getting that data for analysis. Um, the other bulk, bulk of data that we've been seeing is private claims data, either for private insurance, providers, such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, or Optum, or other health providers, or it's public benefits insurance data, so like Center for Medicare Services, or Center for Medicaid Services, a place like that. We get a massive amount of this data at the university, and researchers that get this data don't get it in small doses. They get data in, in terabyte lots at this point, right? The longitudinal data over 20 or 30, 15 years. Um, and from our perspective, you know, from their perspective, they're starting to run into these barriers of being able to do this analysis on tools that they've traditionally been using it on. So this is R, um, SAS is a great example of something that people do this on. Um, Hadoop, we think, is actually a great place for people to do some of the work they need to do. You know, they talk about some of the, some of the analysis they do will take, uh, in SAS, they'll take one to two weeks on their desktop or workstation. And we think we can get that down to a couple days. Um, so from our perspective, what do we do 
Um, we think we know what tools we have to provide. We just need to sit down and provide it. And some of it, you know, so these are tools like Atlas and Knox and Ranger. And it's also going through a compliance framework inside the university to say, okay, you know, you're now cleared to store this data here. Let's, let's start getting start working with it. Um, the other type of analysis we're looking at, not just with insurance data, is also genomic analysis, which is becoming also popular as a part of precision health. So precision health um, is this idea that basically you can aggregate all these types of data, which I've, you know, providers, provider data, genomic references, patient registries, things like that, into one big data source for people to sort through. Um, it's a, we just recently started a precision health initi initiative at the university, um, and they're growing pretty rapidly. Um, and genomic analysis can be one of the toolkits that they need to do their work. Moving from the leading edge of work to bleeding edge of work, um, we know that the university, the data analytics climate is rapidly changing. Um, you know, I think Strata last year, what I want to say, Strata last year they said, you know, Hadoop is dead is a joking thing. Um, I don't think, we don't think Hadoop is dead. Hadoop has its place, um, but it's becoming a niche place. Um, we think that machine learning and GPU data analytics are coming, coming taking the world by storm, effectively. Um, just as an example, our college of engineering, where machine learning is currently the most prevalent, um, they buy these boxes that look a little bit like this. This is not probably direct analog, where they buy GPUs, they'll buy, you know, these uh, eight-way GPU machines with massive PCI lanes. Uh, they'll put, they'll put two, uh, two 19 or 18 core Intel processors, they'll put, you know, half a terabyte or a full terabyte of memory, they'll put two NVMe drives to move the data in and out of the GPUs really quickly, and they'll run machine learning workloads on these. Um, and they buy these things, these, they've been buying three or four machines at a time to, to do this type of work. Um, one of the things that I, we find interesting is whether or not we could come up with an alternative methodology that doesn't depend on Intel on the front end, but depends on ARM. And we look, we know, you know, we're looking at the, uh, the work that ARM is doing with NVIDIA and the contract that was signed there and whether or not that would be helpful to us. We do know that these goal, with, this goal requires a major shift in terms of hardware framework because we know that there's, well, at least I've seen, as soon as I can tell, there's no hardware infrastructure that can hold AGPUs and ARM um, um, processors right now. So this is something that we know there's a lot of work that needs to be done before it goes forward. So Spark, as I said before, is only really the tip of the iceberg. Um, the machine learning ecosystem is dynamic and changing rapidly. The amount of, you know, the amount of machine learning software that's out there, right? You know, each of the big three cloud providers have machine learning software now. You know, Google, My, uh, Microsoft, and Amazon, plus you know, a myriad of other providers. Um, from our perspective, we provide a few tools, so we're looking to provide a few tools on whatever platform we provide. You know, TensorFlow is very popular in our HPC cluster. Um, you know, Keras is out there as well. Past that, you know, it's still this big churn. Um, we don't, you know, one of the things that's interesting is who, how do you pick a winner and what winner that is, is a really interesting question to us. And in some ways, from our perspective, we almost always let the researcher decide. You know, the researcher should tell us what they want and then we provide that for them. There is a bit of give and take where if we come across something interesting that we know a, re a specific research group, usually a larger group is interested in, we'll point it out to them. But uh, for the most part, we're providing what researchers are interested in. Um, and I think an interesting difficulty for us going forward is trying to determine what best to build and debug and support when we move forward with our, uh, ARM64 for machine learning. So in conclusion, uh, with partnership with Marvel, we've built a Hadoop cluster at scale for our researchers to use, and it's been extraordinarily successful so far. Um, we're looking forward to opportunities to build and grow for machine learning um, going forward. And I have to, you know, I can't stand up here today without thanking the three people on the data science team who have done all the work. Uh, Seth Meyer, Mark Patton, and Matt McLean, who have really just done an exemplary job on building this cluster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thanks very much, Jennifer. We really appreciate you coming here and sharing that with us. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to break now. To